we've come to the last three weeks uh, that I have the privilege to preach to you. And God has led me to one of my favorite texts. You heard me say it many times, I have many. <laughs> but this is one of my favorite ones. And I want to share with you knowing and following Jesus. And it comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. And we, today is part one, next week part two, and then the 24th part three. We will cover what the Lord has for us in chapter 2, 17 through the end of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. Our thought today from the text is that the Apostle Paul relates to the church at Corinth how important the new covenant is and the impact it has on people. And from this sermon, I want you to gain a greater appreciation of the treasure that God has implanted in each believer. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, one of the greatest things I can leave with you is to know, to have the knowledge that you are partaker and participant in the new covenant last week we took communion and jesus says this is the blood in my new covenant and all the thousands of years prior from creation to the cross of calvary look forward to what he would do we look back and we rejoice because by grace through faith, we have the Holy Spirit who lives within us, who is the mark of the new covenant. So I challenge you, treasuring the treasure and faithfully following Jesus provides you privileges. And really, that's what this text tells us. From chapter 2, 17 to, through the end of chapter 5, there are special privileges as a believer in Jesus Christ that you have. And I'm going to share eight with you today and the next two weeks. We will read the text as we go through the scriptures. The premise for this sermon and letter from the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth is because of the new covenant. Let me show you chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Paul says to them, Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. He's saying, look, it's not me. We are ministers of the new covenant. And that's what is great. And he's telling them the old covenant, the law, which people today still strive and do and do and do and never can feel good about it because they never have done enough. It kills. But the Spirit of God gives life to those who will receive him and accept him. Now the Apostle Paul is under a lot of spiritual attack. He's being attacked by those who have infiltrated the church at Corinth. They're inside the church. And imposters and frauds in the church were influencing the church family. And Paul's writing to say, hey, beware, this is going on, and here's what you have. You are ministers. We are ministers of the new covenant. You are recipients of the new covenant. Now notice chapter 10, verse 10, and I'll show you how they attacked him. For they say, that is these imposters, imposters these frauds, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. They're saying physically, you know, he's just a dud. The Apostle Paul. 
Oh, he can write. Great. And probably he was not of great physical stature. Or maybe a great speaker. And yet he's the one that God saw fit to use more mightily than anyone else beside the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's under attack and he's trying to help the church at Corinth to understand truth. He's reinforcing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the new covenant, and the Holy Spirit's presence in the believers. When we come to know Jesus as our personal Savior, as we see today and in the next two weeks, these eight amazing and wonderful things, we should be impacted and so impressed that we allow the Holy Spirit to just have complete control of our life. To allow Him to lead us. You know Him and you let Him lead you. Listen, anything else you put your pursuit into will sorely disappoint. I used to be athletic. I know it's hard to believe. But I used to be. But if I put all my eggs in that basket, how disappointing it would have been. I met a wonderful wife. And my daughter said to me, said to Cindy, what in the world did you ever see in him? <laughs> Listen, whatever you put your energy into, if it's not Jesus Christ and following him, you will be sadly disappointed and unfulfilled. So let me show you three of the eight things today. Knowing and following Jesus Christ, number one, gives opportunity to share a fragrance of beauty. Share a fragrance of beauty. God's Word says, chapter 2, verse 12, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door is open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I, because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. So he doesn't have peace. He's in unrest. And it wasn't where God would have him. Verse 14, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, like so many, peddlers of God's word. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Now I want you to see right up front, this is a big button issue right here. Get this. Number one, Jesus leads. Number two, believers spread. Jesus leads. If you're a true believer, you are spreading. You spread. Now you spread to the saved, and you spread an aroma and fragrance to the lost. People know there's something different about you, and what you and I know is it's the Holy Spirit who is within us. It's the new covenant. He only, he alone makes that change. What are the characteristics of a true believer of knowing Christ? Jesus leads us, others are scented, and we must be sincere. That's what these verses right there say. I'm led by the Lord. Others know, because there's an aroma that goes out. And I am genuine. I am sincere. I've often said in these 15 years, the thing I want to be known is that I was genuine. I was real. I don't want to be a fake or a fraud. 
Now there are three things about this fragrance of beauty that we see. 12, verse 12 and 13, he was uncomfortable where he was at. He had no peace, no rest. And the fragrance of this beauty is seen and is known in the arena. The arena. The arena is the open doors that God gives you with the peace that he provides for you. When you are right, and right where he wants you to be, when you are in his will, you have peace, and the scent of God in Jesus Christ fills your arena. Do you get that? When your life is right with the Lord, there's an aroma, a fragrance, a scent that fills your arena. Now, for some of you, your arena may just be your home. That's okay. That may be the only place you have opportunity to spread the fragrance. But it's important to do it there. It might be your neighborhood. It may be your work setting. It might be at the garage or the grocery store. Some place you always frequent. They should know the scent, the aroma, the fragrance of Jesus Christ. It's your arena. I many times can't enter, enter your arena. So I don't go there. You are the fragrance of Christ by the Holy Spirit to disseminate the aroma of the new covenant. When someone lives or is around you and they have the knowledge and see the presence of Jesus Christ, they know there's something different about them. There's something different about them. Now that some in the community know that we are leaving, it, I am just amazed, and I humbly say this, at the incredible comments I've received from ungodly non-church people that are just astounding and my prayer is they seen have seen the love and person of Jesus Christ now you've helped me to do that because when you have put on the nativity and you sit out there or you participate and you're all part of that scene this community knows Jesus Christ and when I walk in a place of business they love and appreciate me and what faith at Newtown is. I've always said to Cindy, you know, people love us, but there's so many people who don't want to have what we have. Yeah, they love us, but there's enough. But that's okay. Because what's the Apostle Paul says, say? Verse 15, we are the aroma of Christ to God among whom? To those who are saved and those who are perishing. Listen, he's the Lord of the harvest. You aren't. He calls and does his work. You're just to keep disseminating Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God, love, joy, peace, the fruit of the Spirit, you're living that out, and it's to the saved and to those who are lost. That's his business. Mine is, in my arena, I just keep letting the fragrance of Jesus Christ be known. And by the grace of God, faith at Newtown has done that. We are family. Not only the arena, there's the aroma. The aroma, verse 14 to 16. As a child and believer in Jesus Christ, he leads us on in victory. This is a triumphal procession. You see that in verse 14. Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. Now here's what's important. When you listen to a Bible teacher, you need to have 
the historical grammatical context of what he's saying, of what the scripture's saying. That's important. The Apostle Paul many, many times had seen the Roman military triumphal processions and he's observed them. And he's relating that now to those who have Jesus Christ. Here's what took place. He worked for the Roman government before his conversion to Jesus Christ. And he would have seen these many times. It occurred when a Roman military war warrior went out to war and won the battle. He won the victory. If he met certain regulations, and there were qualifiers, there would then be a triumphal procession in the streets of Rome, and that procession would wind around the streets and land and end at the temple of Jupiter, whom they worshipped. It was the highest honor any Roman general could have ever achieved. The triumphal procession was a campaign where the triumphs would be brought back. They would bring the booty, the prisoners, the exotic animals, and displays that were captured and march them through the streets of Rome, culminating at the Temple of Jupiter. First in the procession came the Senate, headed by its magistrates and trumpeteers, to announce the arrival. It's just like Macy's Parade. Okay? Then there were carts with tangible spoils of war. And they were followed by white bulls and oxen that were going to be sacrificed at the temple of Jupiter. More elaborate, tri elaborate triumphs would include musicians, exotic flora and fauna, fauna from the conquered land. The arms and were defeated in the enemy and they would put them on parade and followed by the general's lictors walking in single file. So the enemy would be marching right behind them. And then the emperor, who that was called, the one who won the battle, would then be driven by a two or four horse chariot. He'd be adorned innately, embroidered robe and tunic, and what they would do, they would paint his face red in honor of resembling Jupiter. And then last came the general's sons, officers, wreaths, and all the weaponry of the triumph. And the Apostle Paul says, as that fragrance from the flowers and the incense permeated the streets of Rome, they witness this imperator, this victor of war. And the Apostle Paul takes that thought and says, you, as a person of the new covenant, as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, you are led by Jesus every day of your life to dispense the aroma of Christ to those who are in your arena. Not only the arena, the aroma, there's the agenda. Look at verse 17. We are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as many men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Paul says we're genuine. We're not doing any of this for gain. And not my, oh, the preachers that are out there today who do it for gain. There are a zillion of them who are in it for gain. The word peddlers is the only time in all of the Bible that that word is used. It means retail, or to adulterate, or to make gain. It implies making gain with, with deception. And the Apostle Paul says this, if you're a true, genuine minister, 
You speak for Christ, and it's never for gain. You're not in it for the money. Number two, those who speak for Christ must be sincere and genuine. He says, men of sincerity. Listen, all you have to do is hang around a person long enough. For some, it might take an hour. For others, it might take a year. But sooner or later, you will get their heart. You hang around them and be quiet. And you'll know. You'll know where their heart's at. And Paul says, we're sincere. Those who speak for Christ have God's call on their life. They don't work for insurance and then one day just think, oh, I think I'll go be a minister. That looks like it's easier. No, it's a call of God where you can't do anything else it's God's demand on you. And then four, a genuine minister, pastor, minister, has an acute awareness of what they share and how they share it. The truly called minister of God knows they will answer before God about how they presented Jesus Christ, his son. And that's very sobering. You don't just enter the pulpit and shoot from the hip. You study, you learn, and you impart truth to his flock. Number two, number one is give, gives opportunity to share a fragrance of beauty. Number two, it gives opportunity to allow the spirit to impact. And that's chapter three. I'm not going to read the whole chapter for you, but the chapter is all about the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and His work. Look at verse 5 to 8. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministry, ministry of death carved in letters on stone, now that's the law, that's the tablets Moses wrote from the mountain given by God, the Ten Commandments. If the carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of his glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? So we see here the Holy Spirit is the identifying agent of the new covenant. Jesus told his followers, you get back to Jerusalem and you wait till I ascend and then the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. It's known as Pentecost. And Paul explains in this chapter how the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. The law constrains and kills. You cannot keep the law. Law and religion say do, 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 and you never know when you've done enough. And you can't do it. The spirit whom we have has righteousness and more glory than the law. He's alive. He's within you. And the old has blinded many. Paul talks in this chapter about the veil over the Jewish people. And they can't see truth because of the veil that's blinding them. There are two great truths here in chapter 3 about the Holy Spirit's work. And I love this thought. Number one, the truth is people are the evidence. When the Holy Spirit is working... People are the evidence. Look at verse 2 and 3. You yourselves, Paul says you, who he's writing to, I would say to you, you who are sitting here, are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. 
And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. There is nothing that makes me more thrilled than to say, Faith at Newtown, you are our letter of recommendation. God has worked in your lives. Amen? You are not what you were 15 years ago. Thanks be to him. Thanks to him. Because it's the Lord and it's the Spirit of God that has worked through you and you are our letter of recommendation. Paul's facing, uh, what do you, who are you? What are you? You're just a fraud. No. Look at the people. People are the evidence. People changed by the Spirit of God verify the work of Jesus Christ. The size of a church doesn't matter. You get that? The size of a church does not matter. Change lives by and through Jesus Christ is what matters. That's what matters. Now you, and I say all that to give you this challenge. Because you now must let the Spirit of God who's in you touch someone else's life in the years to come. That's ministry. You need to make that your mission. Listen, I'll give you a definition of ministry. Making an internal impact into someone's life. By the grace of God, I pray that's happened to you. And by the grace of God, you, even if it's just one person, just one, in the years to come, just one, make an impact, an eternal impact in somebody else's life. Just think, uh, there's a little over 30 people here. If every one of us touch one life with an eternal impact, we're going to sit around the throne of heaven and we're going to be talking together. And you will have somebody by you that I may have never even known but is in heaven with us. There's nothing greater than that. People are the evidence. Number two, the Holy Spirit is the enablement. The Holy Spirit is the enablement. Verse 4 to 18. Changed lives are the evidence. How's it happen? Well, let me tell you. You can't do it. It's not you. But it is the one who lives within you who can. You can impact others because you have believed in the new covenant. I'm going to give you 10 privileges that are here in chapter 3. I'll go through them quickly. 10 privileges to help you impact others. You can't say, I can't do it, because he lives within you. Here are 10 privileges to help you impact others. <coughs> Number one, you have eternal life. Verse 6, the Spirit gives life. Listen, there's not one person who doesn't want that. A great life now and eternal life then. Verse 6, will not the ministry of the Spirit. That is, He's in you. You can't do it. He does it through you. Verse 8, there's glory. Will not the ministry of the Spirit have more glory? You can touch and impact others because He's in you, not because of you, and it will produce glory. Verse 9, there's righteousness. 
It's the ministry of righteousness. You're doing the right thing. You live for him. You touch other lives with this aroma and fragrance that comes from, from Jesus Christ through you. And you do the right thing. And that's going to impact others. How's that happen? You won't gossip when they're gossiping. Because that's a sin. You won't participate. Or... You won't steal. Or you don't curse when all the office is doing it. Or you are so kind, people drop their jaw. Wow, you did that for me? Yeah, that's because he lives within me. And your kindness, your forgiveness, your love, your joy... You might be the only joyful person in the whole neighborhood or the whole workplace. But you should have it because he lives within you. And it's seen and known. Verse 12, there's hope, which is assurance. Since we have such a hope. Listen, you have a future that is glorious. Don't walk around moping and discouraged all the time. They should see and hear your hope. And then verse 12 is, we are very bold. Our hope and confidence is something that the world lacks. The world has pride, but in Christ you have boldness. God has given us assurance, therefore we're bold and confident. Not cocky, just this is truth. And then verse 14 and 16, spiritual understanding. Only through Christ is that veil removed. You're following Christ. You now understand scriptures. Listen, there was a day, I'll bet many of you, scripture was only for when you met at a funeral. Now, you're reading a verse every day. That's what he does. That veil's removed. I have understanding now. Verse 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom or liberty. Religion used to tell you, do this or give this or you didn't give enough or do more. No longer, you're freed from that. Verse 18, you're able to see the glory of Christ, beholding the glory of the Lord. Let me tell you, Jesus now is special to you. He's not just a curse word. And actually, some of you who have worked with me, when somebody uses his name as a curse word, I get lit. It bugs the Harry out of me. Ugh, don't you take my Savior's name that way. Because he means so much now to me what he did for me. In verse 18, we are being transformed into the same image. There's Christ-likeness. Listen, you're his representative. You're like Christ. Let me show you verse 18 quickly before I move to the last point. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. There's great truth here. The word transformed into, you are being transformed into, is one Greek word. It's metamorpho. You know what that is. Metamorphosis. What a caterpillar does, wraps a cocoon, comes out a butterfly. It's completely changed. This is what Christ does in you. He takes the veil off and he comes into your life and he's changing you to where you're transformed or you're metamorphosized. I made that word up, but you can hang on to it. Metamorphosized. He is changing you. Now get the next part. Into the same image. You know what that word image is? In the Greek, it's starts with an E, you would pronounce it icon. 
you use a computer, your home screen is full of what? Icons. The very image. So when you hit Google, it goes to Google. You are being metamorphosized, changed to the icon of Jesus Christ. So when others here on earth see you, they see an exact image of Jesus Christ. That's the change he's doing in you. And I can give testimony to you. I knew some of you 10, 8, 15 years ago. And he has changed you. I've seen it to where you're more like Jesus Christ. You used to get angry or curse. And now it's, Lord, now you pray. Lord, help me. Lord, you handle this. That is such a marvelous truth, verse 18. You're being changed to the image of Christ. Look at the last thing today. He gives opportunity, when you know and follow Jesus Christ, he gives opportunity to remain committed to truth. Verse 1 to 6, I won't read the whole thing, but we are connected to truth. Truth is God, truth is God's word. And truth is found in Jesus Christ. You live in a day where everyone defines truth as what they want it to be. And it's not. The only truth that's reliable is what you find in the Word of God. And all truth has to flow through what is in Scripture. It has to align itself with what is truth here in the Word of God. Verse 1 is the key to understanding chapter 4. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Hey, you're going to get discouraged. It may have happened yesterday. You don't lose heart. Because you know who's leading you. You know who you know. He's the anchor for your soul. We have the ministry of the new covenant. Notice it's only by the mercy of God. And we do, new, do not lose heart. There's no difficulty that's going to get you to turn aside or turn your back on the Holy Spirit or your life. If that happens, you've never had Jesus Christ. And in spite of the opposition you may encounter, you never stop, you never give up. And trust me, the Apostle Paul knew more opposition than you've ever faced. He died for his Savior. Notice how we're connected to truth in spite of hardships and discouragement, verse 1. Verse 2, in spite of dishonest crooks who peddle the word of God. There he brings it up again. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. I just saw on TV this week, and I was revolted by it. One of the crooks was peddling, saying, you need this. And it was a little package of holy spring water. Well, I can go buy a Poland spring water and enjoy it at Big Y. You don't need their devised fables. You don't need their cunning devices. You need the Word of God, not some contrived plan that asks for your money. Water comes down from above. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. We need rain right now. You know who can provide it? God alone. It falls out of his sky. And it's the Holy Spirit inside the believer that does the work of God. Not some special contrived little contraption. 
And then verse 3 and 4, there's the rejection of many. Many turn aside. Many don't want it. But verse 6, truth shines his light in the darkness of the world. And you are conformed to his image by helping others. God said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Your commitment to truth can help others have the opportunity to see Jesus Christ. Listen, the co-workers you work with, the neighbors you have, the people you know are searching for something that's worthwhile. You may have opportunity to share it with them, but they need to see first it's made the difference in your life. I hesitate to say this, but to get the point across, I will. We're in process with the lawyer's office and settlement, etc. More than once now, as we go through this sale, a person in our lawyer's office has said this to me. I have not even told my wife this. This is what is said more than one time to me. I wish all our clients were as nice as you. Now that's sad and yet it's glad. But they see a difference. Do they see a difference in you? They need to. Treasuring the treasure you have, the Spirit of God, in you, the new covenant, the promise He has given to you, His Spirit lives within you, and faithfully following Jesus provides all these blessings. For you see, Jesus leads, you dispense the aroma of Christ, you commit to truth, and you endure the hardships. Don't lose heart. Endure them. It's going to be worth it. And that's where the Apostle Paul's heading in the next couple sermons. It is worth it all. Our application is simple. If you're not dispensing a sweet Christ-honoring aroma, then you have to ask yourself, is Jesus leading me? And second, am I committed to his truth? If he's leading you and you're committed to his truth, you know him as your savior, then others know. And you are the evidence. And thanks be to God. Thanks be to him. I'm going to pray, then I want to say a word before we stand and have this last song. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. It's so relative. It's right where we live. We need to dig out the truths, and then we need to be not only hearers, but doers of the word of God. May we yield complete control to the Holy Spirit who lives within us. If there's someone here who's listening online or here today that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, Lord, you can make a difference in their life. They need to just realize you are the Savior. You came, you died for their sins, you took their place. We're sinful people. And all you ask of us is to receive the gift, God's gift, His Son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sin, the perfect one who took our imperfectness and our sinfulness on himself, died and rose again and is victorious over death and hell. May they humble themselves, ask forgiveness from you, and ask you to be their Lord and Savior. Lord, save the one that's closest to hell. Lord, thank you for people who have evidenced the new covenant, Christ living in them. Help every one of us to be more of the icon of Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you for it in your precious name. Amen.